I was not feeling well, and so I hadn't really prepared anything. And and then I, you know, reached out to Pastor Manny if he could do tonight's service, but then he's sick, so um, he couldn't do it. So, um, you know, God is so faithful all the time. And, um, you know, I... I like to, you know, study, so that's a gift that, you know, he's given me, so when something does come up, you know, you're not, you're not like, scurrying all over the place, like, what am I, you know, what should I say, and this and that, and um, tonight's message was right on time with um, the music, as usual, and uh, what Sister Annie has to say, and um, this message, it could, um, it could have a lot of titles, but the title that I gave it is Intimacy with God. And we, we need that. We need that to survive. Amen. So um, my key text is um, Jeremiah twenty nine thirteen, And ye shall seek me and find me. And that's what um, Sister Ann was talking about. When ye search for me with all your heart. That's all right, Violante. She's not bothering me. <laughs> she's, she's happy. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So Jeremiah 29, 13, you shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And that's the key there, with all your heart. And um, in other words, like I kind of broke it down. In other words, when we come... When we come looking for God, we will find him. And yes, when we get serious about finding him and want him more than anything else, we will not be disappointed. Amen? Amen. So, um, you know, he's not going to forsake us. If we draw nigh to him, he will draw nigh to us. You know, this world is all about choices. God has given man the power of choice. Anything we do is because we made the choice. Even the most simple things like what we eat or wear, everything's a choice. What time do I go to bed? What am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? Everything in life, you can't do anything without making a choice. You know, do I um, go grocery shopping today or do I wait till Friday? I mean, all kind of stuff. So in Matthew 6.24, it says here, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. How true is that? It's so true. You can't be in the middle road. It's impossible. You're either for God or against him. And it's like that in the natural, too. You're, you're either for President Trump or against him. There's no middle line, you know. So Jesus says it, says it plainly in Matthew 12, 30. He that is not with me is against me. Can't get any simpler than that. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. And, of course, there's the famous scripture that we always talk about from Joshua 24, 15. It says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Amen? So we see that, we see here that intimacy with God is a choice. And as Sister Ann said, you know, we need to make steps towards that. It's just not going to happen. We have to pursue God. So let's um, talk about a little bit about having an encounter with God. Who here wants change in their life? Amen. I want change in my life. So what needs to happen to us to bring that change about? That's what we need to ask, ask ourselves. What do I need to do to bring that change about in my life? We need to have an encounter with God. Amen? That's the only thing that's going to change us. We can't change on our own. 
We have to have that encounter with God. When we have an encounter with God, we are immediately changed forever. Amen? I know when, um, when I got saved, I had gone to a uh, Bible study, and um, I had an encounter with God. I wasn't seeking God. I was at a Bible study because I had company from California, and he had gotten saved. And I didn't know it, but and wanted to go to a Bible study. So, of course, you know, as a heathen, you can imagine what I was saying to myself. <laughs> so I brought him. And I don't even know what happened. But when I got home, I was just, you know, I said, Ma, where's your Bible? I was just so excited. So she's looking at me, you know, so um, she gives me her Bible, and I'm, I mean, I am just going through the Bible, and I actually saw the words on the pages pulsating. I'll never forget it. That's, you know, it's like moments like that nobody can ever take away from you. And, um, you know, and I remember my mom, because she had been praying for me for a year and to be saved, and. She was just like smiling from face to face, and, and I'm just like, Ma, did you see this? Ma, did you? like she never saw it, right? She was already a Christian. But I, was, I had an encounter with God, and um, it wasn't on my timing because as far as I was concerned, I was fine the way I was, you know. But God knew my need, and he met me. When we are in the presence of God, he brings about radical change. That is for sure. And, you know, it's like um, I don't usually talk about my past life, but, you know, like most heathens, and I grew up in the hippie era, and I did all those things that everybody else did. And, um, you know, God just delivered me from all that instantly. Instantly. I, I didn't even, it didn't even come in my mind like stuff I was doing every day. I was so enthralled with Jesus that I never even thought about anything that I did as a heathen. And, um, you know, God can do that for me. He can do it for everybody. Amen. So, um, you know, when we have an encounter with God, there's a, ch a radical change. We see all through the scriptures but somehow we don't understand that the God of the scriptures is the one who is encountering us. You know, it's like we read all the time, and it's just like we're not grasping it. Sometimes we grasp it. Sometimes, you know, we're enlightened and we understand, but then sometimes we don't. And so when we go to prayer, we are hoping for an encounter with God, right? I don't just go to prayer just to go to prayer. I mean, I have needs and everything that I want to bring to God, but as I'm there, I'm hoping, I'm hoping for an encounter with him. When we come to church on Sunday, we come to worship our God, but we are also hoping for an encounter with him. Amen? Amen. Even on Wednesdays, when I pray with pastor, I ask the person of the Holy Spirit to manifest himself to us. Yes, it's a Bible study, but we should always be looking for that encounter with God. It should always be the desire of us so that our lives can be changed. You know, we, we come to Bible study and we enjoy Bible study, but as believers, we should desire more. That should be part of our appetite. Amen? So let's look at Isaiah's encounter with God. In Isaiah chapter 6, we see the remarkable encounter Isaiah had with God. Suddenly, well, you know, everybody knows that chapter 6. It's when, you know, he said he was a man of unclean lips and stuff. So suddenly Isaiah was in the presence of the holiness of God. If we get into the presence of the holiness of God the way Isaiah did, I would have to say that our reaction would be one like Isaiah's. Woe is me, for I am undone, 
because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. You can find that in Isaiah 6, 5. That is what an encounter with God does. And um, my husband, at um, one point, I was, I was kind of like still, I was still a new Christian, and he went off for a fast and, uh, with the pastor and some other pastors. And, um, and my eyeglass thing is falling out, sorry. And, uh, and so I was seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit because it seemed to me that everybody in our church was speaking in a foreign language. And, of course, you know, you, you see that and you want what they have and you're excited. And so I was just seeking God, seeking God. I mean, like, I'd lay out and I'd say, God, you know, what is it? Please tell me, like, what am I doing? What, what sin in my life have I not seen? Like, put, you know, put your flashlight on me and, and this and that. And, you know, so... Um, well, anyways, to get back to when my husband went away fasting, so he comes home, and there was a prayer meeting that night, and I was, you know, oh, you know, can you stay home, and, you know, you've been gone all week. I was just complaining. And he's like, no, you know, pastor has a lot to do, and so I'm going to fill in for him. So we went, and we had an encounter with God that night, and I'll never forget it. Bob Lewis was there, and some other people, you know, from the Rhode Island area. And God was moving. People were on their faces and just confessing sin. And, and at that time, you know, I was really very, very shy. And my husband said, I turn and I look, and there you are. Like, I never saw you before in front of people, like, just prostrate on the floor. And he said, and, and you got up. And the words came out of your mouth. I will go anywhere and I will eat rice for all the days of my life. Like, because what happened was when my husband asked me to marry him, of course, you know, I'm in love and I'm like, oh, you know, he's like, I'm called of God. I'm going to be traveling. He's telling me all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, you know, <laughs> so, um, but it wasn't said with my heart. It was just like I just said it because I didn't want anything to interfere. You know, I still needed a lot of sanctification. I was kind of like a new Christian. So, I, you know, there, I didn't want anything to interfere with our marriage not taking place or anything. And so that night I had an encounter with God. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit because... I had confessed my sin, and I was, you know, God was just leaving me where I was because that was the chastisement. You know, I made a vow. It says it's better not to make a vow at all, you know, that, than to make a vow and not pay it. And um, so that was my chastisement for that whole year, just, you know, seeking God, seeking God, but God in his mercy that night baptized me in the Holy Spirit and it was an encounter with God that's another thing that I will never forget so um, could that same encounter happen to us that happened to Isaiah of course it can because we serve the same God do you think God has someone to whom he wants to send you could be it doesn't even have to be overseas, you know. It could be right here in our community, in our city. So um, it could be in the grocery market. You know, I, I go to Walmart, I go to the grocery market, and I'm always talking to somebody because you're in line and you're waiting. So what else is there to do? Just start talking. And um, it, it's amazing. People are hungry. They don't even know it but they are hungry. Is there something in our hearts that is keeping us from fulfilling the full will of God in our lives? 
because I don't feel that I have accomplished everything that God has called me to do. And I don't actually even know what that is all about. But you know what? Be available. You know, do not stay tied to the dock. Untie you, yourself from whatever you're tied to and let God use you. So are you ready? Can you anticipate a life change in just like the ones that happened in scriptures? Can you imagine like all these great things that happened in scriptures could actually happen in our own personal life. So how do we get there? We get there with passionate, persistent, prolonged prayer. Prayer is not for us to have the opportunity to tell God what we want him to do, right? So many times it's like, God, get me out of this mess, God. <laughs> God, you know, I need finances. God, I, I need healing. God, I need this. You know, we're always, like, telling God what we want him to do. But God has his own plans for us. Prayer is to be in the presence of God where he graciously tells us what is on his heart and his mind. Amen? Amen. And that encounter so radically changes us that everything about our life changes. The way we live, the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we plan, the way we invest our time, it changes. When you're in the presence of God, when you have that encounter, you can't help but change. You know, you can't be in the presence of God and then just go about your daily business the way you were. It's impossible. So do you think that we're in a... a moment of crises here in America and across the world? Of course we are. I mean, we sent a, another ship out with North Korea, and there's all kind of stuff going. So we need a radical change, amen? Because we're God's people, and we're the only hope for this earth through Jesus Christ, amen? Do you believe that, um, do you believe that we need to, a mighty touch from God to touch somebody, we need that. We need to show his passion. We need to pray until God responds. Amen? Amen. Little prayers will not work. I mean, anybody can pray a little prayer, but it's passionate, persistent, prolonged prayer. That's what's going to work. Amen. In Luke 18, Jesus said that we ought always to pray and to never cease. Amen? He gives us the illustration of the woman who came to the judge and persisted until he granted her request and then said that your heaven, and then um, Jesus said that your heavenly Father hears those who cry out to him day and night. So if you know, that story about that woman that was bothering the judge, you know. A lot of times, like, natural life is the same spiritually. We just have to check in, you know. <laughs> you know, so many times, you know, we, we don't get it. You know, she was like a real pain. I, I You know, somebody was banging on my door like that, too. I'd like, here, yeah, get away. <laughs> here you go. And so... Um, you know, God says um, that he hears us cry. He hears the cries of the saints day and night. Now, I'm going to ask you something, but don't answer me. But just something for you to think about. And um, it, it'll help you in your prayer, prayer life, uh, as a personal prayer life, and in your family, as a couple in the church. At, it'll, it'll help the church in... Can you honestly, with all honesty, that you know what is on the heart of God concerning what is to come to be? With all honesty, can we say that we are so in tune with God that we know exactly what's coming down the road? We don't. We don't. I mean, you know, sometimes God shows us stuff, but that should be like a, a normal thing. We should be able to be checking in and just um, hearing from God all the time. You know, we need that persistent prayer. 
And God is willing to do that for us. If God were here to expose our hearts, will he find those who know him and believe him and have already made a commitment to spend passionate time in his presence? Well, obviously, yes, because the worship team, amen, amen, you know, and um, this is all God because I didn't really know what I was going to do. All, all the way through the Bible, when God is about to do something, he looks for someone who will come before him in prayer. You may not know what it may involve, but you do know one thing, and that is what the Spirit of God is saying to you. He is saying, do not let this moment go by. And that's what Ann was talking about. You all know here what I'm talking about, because anyone who's here at this Bible study and anyone who's listening on Facebook, it's there. You're here and you're listening because God has put a desire in your heart. So everyone here knows what I'm talking about. You know those moments. And so many times, you know, it's like God is, is uh, drawing you by his Holy Spirit. And you kind of like, well, you know, I would love to spend time with you, God, but I really need to wash my floor or, you know, whatever's going on. And, and so we, um, we let those moments go by. And don't let them go by too often because they're not going to come back. God is seeking your life. He is pursuing you. He wants to instruct you and to teach you how to pray so that your life will be known as one through whom God made a difference and turned the course of history. Amen? We can turn the course of history. We can. Amen. Amen. The Apostle, uh, the Apostle Paul stated it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we pursue man, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. What the Apostle Paul was saying here is there's no, it's no light thing to know that we're all one day going to stand in the place of judgment, right? Even as a saint, it's a pretty scary thing. <coughs> Excuse me. That's why, we that's why we work urgently. That's what the Apostle Paul was talking about. That's why we work urgently with everyone we meet to get them ready to face God. Amen? So that, that is our, our thing that we should be doing. We need to warn people. His, his love has the first and last word in everything we do. Amen? You know, sometimes I should be praying about a certain situation, and, and I, I forget. Like, I just, because God's given me, me the ability to do it in the natural, you know, sometimes I forget, and shame on me, because we should be praying, we should be asking God, what is the motivation or lack of motivation in our life to be a person of prayer through whom God will change the course of history, or change the course of our family, or church, or our city, or state, or nation? What is the motivation or lack of motivation? I am convinced that God can do anything through us if we yield ourselves to him. Amen? That's what it's all about. We need to yield. Would you be one of those that will be yielded to God? Amen. I know everybody here wants to do that. Everyone here wants to be yielded to God. Everyone has to make that personal decision on his or her own. No one can make it for you. You know, pastors and teachers and, and friends and family, they can put stuff out there, but it has to be your final decision. God 
waits to see what we will do next. Amen? Once we know the truth of God, what we do next is what we believe about God. There is much at stake. What we do in our life tells people how much we believe God and what he talks about. We are a living epistle. Eternity hangs in the balance for men, and we hold the balance. You might say, everyone has a free choice. Yes, that is true, but it is up to us to give them the good news. Amen? Amen. The love that we have for God should compel us to go out and tell them. Amen. Let's look at Jude 1, 22 to 23. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the, uh, the garment spotted by the flesh. So some will, you know, will touch by our compassion that God has given us, but some are a little more tougher than others. And they, we need to have a different approach, and we rely on the Holy Spirit for that. Let us ask God to help us yield ourselves again and again before him, weeping until we hear what he wants from us. You know, what does scripture say? Who will weep for me between the porch and the altar? That's where we need to be. We need to cherish every bit of hunger we have for God. It says here in Matthew 25, 29, Unto everyone that hath, Jesus says, shall be given. So even if it's a little bit, we need to cherish that. Cherish the faintest longings for God, for God, that we have, and more longings will be given to us. Amen? We know that that's true. If God leaves you to try you for chastisement, as he did Hezekiah, seek him anyway. You know, it's like, okay. I mean, we're smart people. God leaves me. Pretty much I know why he left, right? I mean, we'd be so ignorant if we didn't know. I mean, I can't even imagine. I mean, everybody knows when they do wrong, even little babies. Did you do that? No? <laughs> but they know they did. So don't run to friends for solace, but seek the Lord. Friends can help, that's true. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness Seek God, believe him, honor him, and he will honor you. And that's in uh, 1 Samuel 2.30. Let's talk a little bit about the blessing of the Lord. It is a blessed thing when we hunger after the things of God. And we should be thankful for these urges within our soul to seek the Lord. Amen? Amen. You know, those little longings that come. You know, just... Don't turn them aside. Thank God that he put that desire in our hearts. The very desires to please God come from him, and we should earnestly press in to know him better. Oh, may we never grieve the Holy Spirit by neglecting these inward longings after God. You know, and we don't want to do that. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. Like I said, don't let that moment go by because... If you continue to do that, it's just going to be gone. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matt, uh, Psalm 107, 8 and 9, The Lord satisfieth the longing soul, and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. And in Luke 9, 23, If any man will come after me, Jesus says, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. These are, you know, scriptures that God is giving us that, you know, he's, he's going to bless us if we hunger and thirst after him. He's, he's going to, you know, fill that thirst. Amen? The Christian life is a walk, a day-by-day, -day, continuing in fellowship with God. The Christian life involves a denying of self day by day, a giving up of our ways that we may take on the ways of the Lord because we love him. Amen? We need to um, 
die daily, in other words. A hindrance to the things of God. Love not the things of the world. Do you choose the world or do you choose God? That's the question. You cannot have both. No man, as we said earlier, can serve two masters. In 1 John 2.15, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Amen? That is, that's the truth right there, plain and simple. In James 4.4, 4, Know ye that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an enemy with God. Another plain and simple scripture. You can't get any plainer than that. You're either in the world or you're for God. So let's set our hearts to seek God. We're going to talk a little bit about Daniel. And in Daniel 9.3, he says, And I set my face unto the Lord God. Daniel wrote the above during the Babylonian captivity. When he when he and his people went into captivity, he was only 17 years old. And neither he nor any of the Jews knew how long the captivity was going to last. However, Daniel, being the good student that he was, when Daniel saw the shift of power from uh, Belshazzar to Darius the Mede, in order to get some understanding as to what the changes were that were taking place were all about, Daniel searched the scriptures that were available to him in that day. Imagine that. When he read the writings of the prophet Jeremiah, he discovered that Jeremiah said the Jewish captivity in Babylon would last 70 years, and so it did. At the time Daniel was uh, writing these words in chapter 9 of Daniel, the 70 years were fast coming to a close. Daniel was a man who lived in close, intimate fellowship with God. And we know that by reading. Since Daniel now knew that freedom for his people and himself was near, he wanted to make sure that his people were not in a weakened state of spiritual condition. He cared for them, and that's what prayer does. When we pray for people, it gives us this compassion and this love for the people that we are praying for. You see, they were there in captivity through God's uh, chastisement because of sin. So they were in bad condition, and Daniel knew that. But he wanted to get them in better spiritual condition so that when they were able to leave captivity, that they would be strong spiritually. Daniel wanted them to approach the time of their emancipation with sins forgiven. I believe he wanted his people to be in fellowship with their God. Thus, his fervency went, he went to the throne of God on behalf of his people and himself. And that's what we need to do. We need to go to the throne of God with fervency, not only for ourselves, but for the house of God, for the unsaved. Amen. Daniel said, I set my face unto the Lord. That was in Daniel 9.3. Daniel had determination. He had the intensity of heart, this deep-seated desire, this driving, persistent resolve to seek his face and to seek God. Amen? Daniel had something the average Christian knows little about. Shame to say. Where is our enthusiasm towards God? Has life consumed us to the point that we are too occupied with other things when we should be seeking the kingdom of God first? Paul wrote in Colossians 3, 1 and 2, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above with Christ, seated on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on the earth. I'm not saying that we can't enjoy the things that God has given us here on the earth, of course. You know, we have friends, you know, we have beautiful land, and, there's a, and you know, we have vacation. God, God has blessed us. And I'm not saying that, but we need to put our priorities in order. Scripture says, he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. 
and that's in Hebrews 11.6. And again, in Psalm 34.11, Come ye children, hearken unto me. He's calling us. That, and then in Psalm um, 27.8, Thou sayest, seek my face. In James 4.8, James said, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Amen? The desire to draw nigh to God is the most precious possession. We have a lot of possessions in this world, but the most precious possession is that of seeking God. Nothing could be more valuable to the believer, to you and to me, than to have this hunger of heart and this thirst of soul after God, this pursuit of God within our very being. Amen? It has to be a pursuit in our very be being to pursue after God. And we can have that. We just have to ask God for it. Because and no one wants God. You know, we didn't seek God. He sought for us. A.W. Towser writes, we pursue God because and only because he has first put an urge within us that spurs us to the pursuit. And that came from the pursuit of God, page 11. So let's stir up that flame of desire into fervency. Amen? We have the desire, but we need that fervency. We need that persistence. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells us about talents. A man gave his three servants their assignments and then took a journey. He gave them each what he knew they could handle. When he returned, he had a business meeting with them. Two of them he was uh, pleased with and promoted them because they had doubled what he had given them. The third one was fired because he did nothing with the talent that was given to him. And sadly to say that sometimes God has given us a talent and we don't do anything with it. A desire for God is like a talent. Each of us has been given a measure of desire, just like a measure of faith. Each of us has been given a measure of desire. If we take that desire to the exchanges, it will increase. The exchanges are anything that will increase our desire for God. Amen? Things like prayer, things like fasting, study, praise, worship, these things will always increase our desire for God, and the more we do them, the stronger our desire will get. Amen? Deep in the heart of every Christian is the call of the Holy Spirit. So God has given us the ability because he gave us the Holy Spirit. He said when he left that he was going to send us the comforter. Well, the Holy Spirit is our comforter. And when we reach out to him, he will be there to help us. So we need to have a place by God. During Israel's trek across the wilderness, Moses was up to his neck with problems. A multitude of hard-headed, rebellious people made him finally realize the job was too big for him. You know, and I, I do the same thing. Do you need help? No. I mean, I'm passing out. <laughs> do you need help? No. Yeah, that, that's such a lie. And I think, I think we all do it because we all want to be, I can do it, I'm self-sufficient. So he cried out to God for help. God responded by informing him in Exodus 33, 21. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. Moses went there and had an encounter with God. His face so shone with the glory of God that the people ran from his presence. And Moses had a new power with God. And that's what we need. If we are going to change this nation, if we're going to change this city, we need a place by God. Amen? That, the, that same place by God is open for us, and the same voice is calling us. If, if we will find a way to lay aside our involvements and set a determined course to find him, he has promised he will meet us, and that's what Anne is doing. Amen? Jeremiah 29.13, again, our key verse. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. We all have a fleshly nature that doesn't want us to pray at all. 
especially fervent prayer. Even Elijah, probably the greatest man of prayer in the Bible, had this problem. In James 5, 16 through 18, it says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as us, right? So we know all through Scripture that people that God used were just like us. Amen? So he prayed, and it stopped raining for three and a half years. And then he prayed again, and the heavens opened up. Amen? Do you want to see an example of real fervency? So Ahab went up to eat and drink. So we see that's what Ahab did. He, Ahab went up to eat and drink. I don't see any fervency there. He's just, you know, gratifying the flesh. But Elijah... Elijah went up to the top of Kamal, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. And you can find that in 1 Kings 18.42. He got fervent. He got super fervent, and heaven responded. I wonder what would happen today if God could get someone to pray like that for revival. Well, he's asking us tonight. If you can buy some books, this is, you know, pastors always, if you like to read, you're always wanting to share, like, good books with people. And Andrew Murray's books, um, there's a book, it kind of goes along with what we're um, talking about tonight, The Secret of Fellowship. Andrew Murray has so, so many books. They're paperbacks. They're not expensive books. I think you can get them online for like $1.99 a piece. But in my younger years, I was so hungry for God, and I just, you know, wanted to read godly books. And so my husband started giving me these books. And you can only recognize this if it happens to you. Like, you tell people this, and they're like, oh, sure, that happened, right? But I am telling you, when I read his books, even to this day, which I haven't read them in some time, every now and then, like, I'll go back and read here and there, I could feel the anointing, the anointing on God, of God on the words that he was speaking. And, you know, most of his books are, are on complete surrender and fellowship with God in pursuit of God. He's fantastic, and his name is Andrew Murray. And like I said, you know, you can go online. They're only like $1.99 each. So our walk with God is from day to day. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, The inner man is renewed from day to day. There is one lesson that every Christian should learn, namely this, the absolute necessity of fellowship with Jesus each day. Yes, it's good to listen to messages online. Yes, it's good to watch messages on TV. And, um, it, you know, but unless you take your Bible and you spend time with God, worshiping Him, praying to Him, I can't I can't even explain how different that is. And yet, you know, I'm not saying don't don't pray, you know, God help me and stuff. I'm not saying that. God knows we need help, and he's there to hear our petitions. And God put uh, godly men in positions to speak his word to us and to teach us. But there's nothing like holding your Bible in your hand and seeking God, praying and worshiping him. It'll change your life. So Matthew 11, 25 through 30, he says, um, I won't read the whole thing, but basically it says, Come unto me, and I will give you rest. Learn of me, and you shall find rest for your souls. Well, the only place you're going to learn that is spending time with him. Time alone with God is essential. You know, like uh, brushing your teeth is essential every day? Well, spending time with God is essential. 
we must have fellowship with him daily. Daily communion with God is first of all a matter of fellowship, meditating every day personally in God's holy word, waiting earnestly and, pers and personally before God in prayer. Just think every day we can come and meet God and have fellowship with him. Isn't that awesome? This, every day we can come into his presence. It's a matter of survival. It's not only a matter of fellowship, it's a matter of survival. The born-again man or woman has a new disposition, a new nature, another life implanted within him. The new nature and the old nature are in conflict, the one with the other. We know that, and Paul also speaks of that. The Bible puts it like this. The spirit is warring against the flesh, and the flesh is warring against the spirit, and that's in Galatians 5. 17. It is up to us as Christian men and women through the Spirit to mortify the old nature and the deeds of our flesh and to cut off its supply. Amen? That's right. We need to cut off the supply. We know those areas that we are weak in. And one thing, like when I got saved, I knew right away the demons in my life. I knew that if I had done certain things, I would have been backslidden like so quick. And even to this day, 30-something years later, I still abide by those rules I have set in my life. Never to do such and such because that will bring you down the road here. And that's what we have to be aware of. So... Um, if you read Romans 13, it talks about uh, making no, uh, no provision for the flesh to fill the lust of the flesh thereof. We need to have a tent of meeting like Moses had. We need to have that disciplined place. I, I don't care where it is. It could be in the bathroom. You know, I, I know like um, when Bob and I go someplace and, and you know, he's, He's in bed, he's resting, or he's sleeping, and I want to spend time with God. Well, there I am in the bathroom, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's not the most convenient place, but it, it's a private place, and, and that's what we have to do. We have to have a disciplined place. Moses had a regular place where he met with God. He took the time and effort to pitch a tent, which he even called the tent of meeting, and it was outside the camp wasn't in all the craziness that was going on. It was outside the camp. There are several important items that might escape our attention if we are not careful. We have to note that it was a habit that Moses did. You can read all this in Exodus uh, 33. This was a regular discipline for Moses. He didn't have an idea to just go out one day and pitch a tent. You know, I mean, come on. It was a discipline of having a place to meet with God, and that's what we need. I think it is also important to recognize that he had this tent erected outside the camp, as I said. It was not in the midst of the hustle and the bustle of every day, but outside the camp. Walking with God in the midst of all of life is important, but to draw near in intimacy, we will need a quiet place where we can withdraw and spend uninterrupted time alone with the Lord. Amen. We have to have that passion for his presence. The tent of meeting was a very visible sign to Moses of the fulfillment of God's promise that he would go with them. Because God promised that he would be with them. Moses had begged God not to send them anywhere apart from his presence. Amen. That's what I want. So here, in this very portable prayer room, Moses came to spend face-to-face -face time with God. Moses was a man with a passion for the presence of God, and the visible expression of that passion was coming to the obvious place of meeting. And um, when you're spending time with God, when you're with him and... His presence is, you know, on you. There, people are going to notice. 
I remember, <coughs> excuse me, I remember this man, he was um, a Messianic Jew, he came to one of our prayer meetings, our pastor knew him from school or someplace, I don't know, but um, the man walked into our prayer meeting, everybody turned and looked at him and whispered to one another, this man has been with God. Can you imagine spending so much time with God that his presence is upon you? Amen. You can't hide a life hidden with God, though by its very nature a life of spiritual intimacy and prayer is quiet. It doesn't cry out for attention. The transformation it brings to an individual's life begins um, to be noticed. And here is an old man, Moses, trudging through the camp to the tent, on beyond the others. He is just going to pray, but the times of intimate fellowship have triggered the power of God in a visible way. And as Moses walks into the tent, the heavens open, and a pillar of cloud descends to guard the door to the tent. No one can go in and disturb him. So let's look at the response of the people as he does this. The response of the people, when Moses went to talk with God, the people of Israel paid attention. As he walked to the tent, all along the way the people stood. I believe both in honor and anticipation because they knew he was meeting with God and God was going to give him direction. Something is going to happen, they must have been saying. And indeed, as Moses goes to the tent, the pillar of the cloud descends, and God's visible presence is discerned in the camp. The people began to worship outside their tents. The prayer of this man of God has prompted great worship among his people toward their God. And when we were in Israel and we, we went to the Wailing Wall, we had to go on the woman's side, of course. And it was a sight to behold. There were women at the wall just crying out to God. But then there were women more towards the back with tambourines and scarves and just worshiping God. It was amazing. I, I can't even describe it. So we are not Israel in the desert today. Moses' tent of meeting became the tabernacle, which became the temple, which in awe, we say, has become us. That was a physical temple, but now we are the temple of God. Amen. We are now the meeting place of God. Our very bodies have become his temple. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Emmanuel God with us has taken up residence within us through his Holy Spirit. Amen. That concludes the Bible study for tonight. And, oh, Father, I just thank you. I thank you for the confirmation. Father, I thank you, Lord, that our lives are being changed today. Father, I, I thank you, Father. Help us. Help us by your Holy Spirit to do those things that you've called us to do. Father, I thank you, Father, for all who are participating in this new phase of our life to complete the, your will for our lives. Amen.